Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Outspoken. I'm your host, Eric Shepard. Everything sounds weird, man. I got some new gear. I got a new uh, interface thing. And I got some in-ear things. I'll tell you the story about the in-ears because it was a pain in the ass and it might pertain to some uh, voiceover people. But first, let me bring on my guest. We got a chatty guest, which is fun. Epic voice guy. Epic. Ep- man, that's... That's something. You know him. You love him. Where is he? He's gone. There he is. John Bailey, Mike. Hello. Dude, you dressed up? Really? really? Yeah, for not, this? Not for, I wish it was just for this, but unfortunately, it's it's also for E3, which is going on this week in LA. Ah, uh, it's saying I thought we were special for a second. <laughs> I, mean, I look like the fucking crocodile hunter over here, and this guy's got a freaking tie. Man, oh man, looking good. It's all good. part of the brand, my friend. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I did for years, years and years, man. Uh, I wouldn't do anything without the full suit and tie. I started doing it um, like real early in my career. I did too. I yeah, was, I always said, you know, and I, had, I had like a million dollars. I had freaking nice, you know, suits and uh, billions of ties and stuff, you know. And then it became co- like part of my branding a little bit. You know, people knew like, oh yeah, yeah the guy was dressed up and stuff. And then I was just like, ah, fine. like you get old, you're just like, whatever, who cares? Exactly. Yeah. Like sweatpants and t-shirts are far more comfortable. Yeah, you know, but it was, like, I mean, it was cool, like, you know, for a while. I don't know, it was, it was actually not too long ago that I was like, ah, forget it, man. I'm just going to, I'm wearing a work shirt. I don't care. So anyway, if anything sounds weird or looks weird, anybody who's with us live, let me know. So I switched to these in-ears, not for, you know, like recording or anything, just for, uh, this YouTube nonsense. So I didn't want to spend like a million dollars. You know, I was like, ah, whatever, I'll get some cheapies. So I bought these Shores that like everybody in the world loves. And uh, they were awful, man. They sounded terrible. And there was like pain, like in my head. I'm like, who, really? I don't, you know, I don't know why anybody likes them. So I switched over to these Sennheisers. I got them today, actually. They just showed up in the mail. And uh, so I've tried them out for all of five minutes chatting before the show. So, but I think they're good, man. They sound a hell of a lot better than those shores, but it's weird. It's, you know, when you're used to the cans, it's some maybe I look like a dope with the cans on. Um, but anyway, if anything sounds weird, let me know. John sounds great, of course, because he's in his booth. <laughs> in his booth. In All right. Booth. So let's do the, it's, it's like if I don't do the, you know, I never want to do it. And then it's like, everyone's like, you're going to do the thing, man, or whatever. So we got to do the, how did you start uh, in the business? Because you, oh, yeah. you are patented 47 seconds of uh, uh, research on you. Uh, but we had talked before about that. You were like a, like a flipping burgers, man, and like, like yeah. driving forklifts and stuff. Uh, and then, you know, like a decade ago, and whatever, it was like, boom. Right. What uh, what happened? Yeah, I was just at the regular uh, regular grind, and uh, my my beautiful wife took the time to make me a MySpace page, and uh, I thought that I thought the social media, to be honest, was pretty stupid. So I'm so glad I did not invest in Facebook stock because that would not have worked out great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyways, I thought the social media thing was not a big deal or whatever. And my wife's like, oh, you'll love it. It's got all your favorite stuff on it. And it was before pop-up ads just kind of, you know, they were just there. We didn't have a way to automatically stop them with the brand new computer. It just prevented them. That was Back then you had to fight and download software for it or whatever. So a pop-up ad popped up on MySpace because MySpace was very clever and uh, your profile, you would put in keywords, things you were interested in, but you were actually putting in search engine words for the ads. And my wife had put enough things in there, thank bless her heart, uh, about voiceover, voice acting, voiceover, that an ad for a studio that happened to have a location in Memphis, which is not known for voiceover. We're not known for three things. We're known for blues, we're known for barbecue, and we're known for crime. And, you know, so, and I'm not a big fan of any of those. Uh, so, uh, I didn't <laughs> the, think it was a, a, no voiceover. The, the blues I like by crime and eh, blues are okay. Man. And crimes, eh, you know, uh, but, I could take it or leave it. <laughs> it's the barbecue. It's the sauce. It's you know, uh, anyway, so, uh, we, I just didn't know there was anything voiceover related. I mean, I knew it was a big music town. I knew a lot of famous artists had gotten started there and from there, uh, you know, obviously Elvis and you got BB King and, you know, quite a few others. And uh, I just didn't think anything about voiceover. I've been interested in it since I was a kid, been doing impressions since I was four. I you know, started with Sesame Street, worked my way up and got interested in Transformers because of Ultron and just kind of had this 
desire and the, and the, and the ability to do fun things with my voice all this time. And I'd use that to kind of helped, you know, uh, smooth things over with the in-laws as I was trying to get to know my wife's family before we got married. And so things like that. And it was a trick to do at parties or whatever, but I never, I mean, I had been told from some very big people that, uh, that the kind of stuff that I could do would never get me anywhere in this business. So I didn't have a shot in it. So when this pop-up ad just kind of popped up, my wife's like, you should go try this. This is like, I looked it up. It's only like 15 minutes away. And I'm like, yeah, but it's just a stupid pipe dream. It's like, you know, she's like the worst they can do is say, no, what do you got to lose? And I'm like, huh, I guess I really don't have anything else to lose. So I went and tried out. Uh, I kind of blew them away a little bit and they signed me and hooked me up with some, some not great demos, but they got me, they were free and started getting me just a little small non-union commercial stuff. Uh, the following year, I, I, they signed me January 1st of 2011, uh, 20, 2009. And then I got my first gig. I got my first audition by February 1st, and I booked my first gig by February 11th. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And uh, I booked maybe one to three jobs a month. I thought I was doing terribly. And then uh, the producer was like, hey, we've had people here that have been here five years and never booked a single job. And I'm like, well, I'm glad about that guy. And, yeah, uh, I mean, you start, <laughs> this was quick, man. I mean, you, you're you going to have a lot well, of people wanting know, to kick I, your ass, man. I, this I is, you, so you're driving works. a forklift and then you show up and then, I mean, right away you're booking. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I didn't know, I didn't know how well I was doing because I assumed, I, I was a naive, you know, I just assumed that in order to make a career at it, I had to book like every day or every week or, you know, so I didn't know how well or bad I was doing at all. I was just doing the best I can or could. And uh, so... My, my my YouTube stuff started back in 2007, I believe it was, and I'd done a lot of voice video stuff. And one of them was just me in, in the car, or no, it was me in my booth just doing uh, my my favorite different movie trailer guys, because there's quite a few. There's about a dozen or so. And I did like my my top five favorites that I do really well and made up this fake movie trailer in each each part of the trailer had a different genre of voice because there's more than one vo genre of movie trailer voices, and I happen to do quite a few. So that video, it didn't necessarily go viral, but it got enough views that it made it to pretty high up on the search engines, especially after Don LaFontaine passed away. And my first manager happened to find that, and he ran a trailer company out here in L.A., and he'd hired a few different voice actors. Some of them you probably know their voices very well because they were famous movie trailer guys, including Don himself. He'd worked with him before. And uh, he said, I think you got a lot of potential, a lot of talent. And uh, he started working with me and I started booking with him right away. And he's like, I think I'd like to be your manager. And he's like, I don't manage talent. I have my own trailer company, but I think that you have a lot of potential that I'd like to work with. So I started working with his producers, trying to find my own, you know, not just doing impressions of movie trailer guys, but my, my own unique epic voice. And so, well, that's uh, the was, thing, man. When I first heard, you know, everybody knows I'm a big Don fan. I got a Don tattoo yeah. and, uh, Don helped me a lot in the beginning. Um, but I had heard your stuff, and this was, you know, a long time ago before I knew you or Ripped or any of that stuff. And I was like, is this like a parody or what is, what's the deal? But it seems like it started actually kind of as a, as a parody or an homage and then morphed into like a real thing. Well, my brother had first kind of brought it to my attention. I mean, I'd, I'd heard the movie trailer voice my whole life. But it never was in, you know, the foreground of mine, like, oh, that's a cool voice. But my brother brought the, this uh, Pablo Francisco stand-up routine to my attention. He was like, you should hear this guy who talks about movie trailer voices. It's a really funny thing. And and he does that thing that goes down at the end. You know, he was doing a weird combination of, of Hal Douglas and Don LaFontaine. And my brother was like, I think you can do that better than he can. And so I, my brain kind of I, re, I reverse engineer voices and kind of pick them apart and realize what's what. And then I realized that he'd taken Hal Douglas and Don LaFontaine and merged them together into this whatever that weird voice was. And it wasn't exactly Don or Hal. It was just whatever his version was. And then I found out who Don, uh, who Don LaFontaine was because of that. And it was the uh, Geico commercial that first really made me notice his voice. And I just started doing an impression of that. And then the after I'd, I'd booked quite a few trailers, a couple, couple of hundred within the first couple of years being with him. And but most of it was, you know, not big theatrical. You know, they don't there's not a lot of voiceover in the big theatrical movies. Usually it's a TV campaign that you hear the most voice work on. But most of it was for like direct to DVD movies or uh, movies that went straight to digital. They weren't huge blockbusters. There's a few. And but I'd had a few. And are they, these them. directors are telling you do the Don or. They, no, they, they were just having, they were hiring me for my own movie trailer voice. And it depended on what it was. I did a few horror things. I did, uh, you know, Carrie, the, the remake of Carrie, things, uh, the new RoboCop, 
a uh, few things people would actually know, two guns, Denzel Washington, Mark Wahlberg. And so some of them were actually- Hold on, I got a clip. Just every genre of movie from comedy- Get ready. Have fun. For the party of the year. To action. They call him Machete. Drama. The Blacklist, season two, red edition. Horror. They pushed her too far. And the Emmy-nominated YouTube series, Honest Trailers. Uh-oh. They're going to just rehash everything from Star Wars, aren't they? I so I stole that. How is that all edited up yeah, for us and everything? Yeah, you can see nice. the difference between like, because I try to get a lot of different genres in that clip, um, but you can, can see the difference between the, the serious stuff that I'd done. And then when the Honest Trailers guys came along, they were like, hey, we saw your website from that same video my, my, my manager had seen of me doing these different movie genres in one video. But they clicked on the my website. And so I'm like, dude, you have like 200 trailers. Like you do this for real. And I'm like, yeah. Like, have you seen our, our stuff? And I'm like, no, can you give me a link? And I checked it out. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. And uh, so, so you're, you're it, pretty famous for the honest trailers thing. Yeah. But this was it was actual trailers that came first. And that's yeah. how they found you. They said, this is a real trailer guy. Right. Because that's how I was introduced to you, to that yeah. boy. And I thought it was it might have. I was like, is that that comedian guy? No, no, that sounds different. <laughs> um but again, for, you know, that's why maybe I thought, well, is this kind of a parody thing or what's, you know, because it was a comedy yeah, I didn't thing and they were, I mean, I you know, it bringing it up. it was supposed to be funny. I just didn't know if it was a parody or not. And it didn't really dawn on me until after we got feedback in the comments from the very first one that I worked on. And they said a lot of the, the majority of the comments were not, I mean, obviously people were upset because they had changed voices. But uh, the main comment was that it sounds too good. It sounds too much like a real movie trailer, which is all I had done before that time. And then I was like, oh, I'm parodying myself. I'm basically making fun of my normal job. And then it became like this whole character. It's not even a voice anymore. He's his own, like you hear him talk about his wife and his kids and you know, like he breaks character a lot. So he's become his own entity now. The, well, he's this thing, it's gotten trailer. huge. For those who don't yeah, know, hold on, now. I got a clip. Before you catch Men in Black International and six months on cable or on an airplane or something, check out the film that started it all and the other two that just kept doing it. <laughs> the Men in Blacks. Suit up for three sci-fi comedies set in an alternate reality where the United States accepts refugees and join... <laughs> okay, so for those who don't know, because this is huge, this started online, and then I think it, w it was broadcast at some point or still is... I don't know. But what's what's the premise here? The premise was just to point out all of the inconsistencies or the flaws or just kind of uh, point out all the all the things that, you know, didn't work in, in real life, like things that Luke and Leia's relationship or, you know, the way people say Han and Han, you know, they would point those things out and they would actually sit down and watch through the movies over and over and over again. And they would keep writing in notes about this part doesn't make sense with that part if they just done this and we're not the they, they weren't the only channel that did it how it should have ended had done it and uh, uh the other one cinema sins had been doing this but they all been doing it their own unique way and their concept was well let's do it movie trailer style where we have the actual like it's a movie trailer but it's a trailer that's actually being truthful about what happens in the film because most trailers show you what they want you to see because they want you to watch the movie where we did the exact opposite of that and we're showing the people everything about the movie the stuff that they may not want you to see because like maybe this movie's not as great as you think it is based on the real trailer. So it was kind of that, you know, that, that concept. It's interesting because I have people don't know it's freaking huge, man. Right. I mean, this started, where, what, where did it I start? They weren't their remember. own YouTube station, right? I mean, they weren't their I own channel. It was part of something. Where, I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember exactly when it started. I think it'd been on for at least a couple of years, if not more when I came on and it's gone through a lot of creative changes and a lot of writing changes and a lot of, you know, different stuff. So, um, the concept has always basically been the same, but the frequency and the voices, you know, there's, there's been a lot of little small changes here and there until get where we are now. But yeah, now it's been over, I think it's been over seven years or so. So it's gone on way longer than any of us thought it would. Um, and to the point of, breaking through to the mainstream where it's accepted in pop culture and you know ryan reynolds himself wanted to be part of the you know the deadpool on his trailer so it, you can kind of see once it really reaches celebrity status that it's like oh it's this is a freaking huge thing now yeah and you know and it is neat for you because it is so you know it's self-referential like you said you know the 
the trailer guy now is you, but not. And then he's become his own character. And that's yep. fun, man. It's yep. fun. Fun. It is. And we've had, we've been nominated and lost uh, Emmys three times. <laughs> well, listen, it's an honor just to be nominated. That's what I hear. No, I, I wouldn't know because it's the the whole thing that's been nominated, not me personally. So, uh, yeah, maybe nobody. One, I, one of these one of these days, maybe, right? <laughs> that's what everybody's. You know, I have, no, I didn't. It's an honor just to be nominated. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I would have. Uh, usually, I say it would have been an honor to have been nominated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you all right? So you're Mr. Trailer Guy. That's the epic uh, deal, and then you get honest trailers. That's what you're super famous for. But you do other stuff, man. I always like to talk oh, yeah. about uh, people's other stuff. You do ADR. You've done ADR for Jeff Bridges and who else? You've done ADR for a bunch oh, of folks, so, right? Dude, so freaking many. I don't even have a, I don't have a list in front of me. <laughs> There's so freaking many. Uh, current. I'll just how do, how do you are, get into that? that? How do you start uh, doing that? That one was kind of a, that was a unique story. So uh, not every voice actor has a manager and an agent. Most of them just either have no agent or have an agent or agents. Well, first but of all, and I told you this before, I mean, nobody gets a manager like, it, yeah. Right. Like, I mean, you got one like right away, within, man. Within There's the people who've been toiling years, yeah. for decades, like begging for management, and you're with the big ones. Yeah, that's, big that's one. the, you were the weird thing for me is that that I didn't know any better. I'm just flying by the seat of my pants, pretty much my whole career, just learning as I went along. And sometimes I had to learn things the hard way, but I did learn. And I didn't know that that was it was uncommon for somebody to have a manager and be a voice actor. I just I just went along with what it's it's kind of like Yes Man, like Jim Carrey's movie. Any any opportunity that I see that's positive that does not break my personal moral ethics, like I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'll give that a shot, you know. So yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that kind of happened, and I'm like, oh, I guess this is how it happens for everybody. But no, it does not. And so uh, I uh, I was doing. She was trying me out. She was just giving me a shot because my my first manager realized, and he'd done really well for me. I mean, I, I went from making, you know, uh, poverty level income. Like, that's what I was making. Like, we were getting, you know, government help at some points just to be able to afford formula for our kids. And after my uh, after my job went bankrupt and I started doing voiceover full time, we were all just kind of panicked. We were living from we were living with very little unemployment, uh, unemployment and a little bit of severance pay. And I cashed in what little 401k I had just to try to get by. But those first two years uh, with no primary source of income other than voiceover were really, really difficult. So uh, my first manager realized. Well, he, especially, he, too, because you were green. So you don't, you know, yeah, half, I didn't know any better. <laughs> yeah, half of you doesn't even know what the hell you're doing, man. Yeah. But you're my, falling my, ass backwards into great stuff. You're booking right away. You're know. getting management right away. And you're like, rrr, rrr, rrr. I told <laughs> yeah, you, I, you're going to have actors ready to kill you, man. You got it like quick. Boom. Whoa. Yeah, you know, nice. I heard I heard Jess Arnell's story is pretty much the same thing. And he just walked into a room and didn't know who anybody was, had no idea how big these voice actors were. He's like, hey, man, I'm Jess. I'm just here to rock and roll, bro. You know, and they're just like, oh, you, they just, he just didn't know. He just thought, yeah, you're here to do this too. All right, let's go. So I just, I've kind of had that same, like, I don't know what's going on, but everything's to be working out. So uh, like I said, it went from poverty levels to triple that. And that was like, for us, I thought that was great. <laughs> Tri and, triple uh, poverty is good. <laughs> yeah, triple poverty is, you know, not poverty anymore. So I was okay with that. Um, poverty level, I think, is like less than 20 grand. So uh, a year. So I was like, yeah, I could, I, I'm, I'm not broke anymore. I don't have to use government cheese anymore. Yay. So, uh, but I thought he was doing great, but he wasn't doing as well as he thought he could be doing because he was still running his own company. He's like, I know a manager and I know, and I'm going to get you an agent. I'm going to get you a manager. So he just started going down the list alphabetically looking for people to work with me. And we started with, uh, some company in the A's and then we worked our way down until we, uh, we found my manager who got me my current agency. And then, uh, it was so, just and this was, this, she was just, oh, this dude that you're talking about, this is the one that you found from the dang MySpace pop-up. No, he uh, he found me on YouTube the same way that the Honest Trailers guy did from that video wow. of me doing different movie genres. So it was just a random YouTube video, and he just thought of me. Got he got my kind of kick started my career past the point of just doing a couple of non union commercials a month or so. And uh, so she he was like, well, this other manager that she she's one of the best in the business, and she reps only a, a, you know a couple of dozen people. And she's like, yeah, I'll give it, I'd be happy to give you a shot and we'll give you a few months to, and try you out. And within my first month or so, uh, a commercial audition came down somehow for an Adam Sandler sounded like for Hotel Transylvania. And I'm like, she's like, can you sound like, it? I was like, yeah, I can do that. 
So she gave me an audition and I ended up booking like 53 spots, a McDonald's commercial, and then two, two trailer, you know, trailers or something. So it was a lot. It was a whole freaking bunch. And she was like, yeah, I think we want to sign you. And so yeah. at that point, all I know, sudden, everyone's I always getting, like, how do you get a good with an agency and blah, 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 for, earn? Look, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like make some money. <laughs> yeah, man. Work. They, like, we really don't, like I'm not that. doing this for my health. Jesus. <laughs> So that kind of helped me get in with her. And then because of that one gig that I did book through her, uh, it, it kind of just opened up the door for ADR auditions, which I had never gotten anything before. And I, even one of her former employees even had even told me before I came along, they didn't do any ADR. And now it's become like a third of their business or something. And it's definitely a huge chunk of my business. And currently, because I can't remember them all, but currently I'm right now filling in for Robert Downey Jr. for Dr. Doolittle stuff. And I'm filling in for Ryan Reynolds for – well, I was filling in for Ryan Reynolds for Detective Pikachu before it came out. Um, and I'm also in the film as a separate additional voice, which is really cool. So I got a credit for that as well. And uh, then I'm filling in for um, – who's the other guy? Uh, Josh Gad for Dog's Journey 2 or Dog's Purpose. Wasn't he it Olaf? Is. Isn't it that guy? It's also Olaf, yeah. Yeah, then, yeah. My daughter's like obsessed with Frozen, man. So I watched like a billion times. He did so good in that, man. He has a good. There's character. one. There's one other one I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, and then there, I'm I'm doing trailers for uh, an upcoming thing on uh, either Discovery or History. So it's just like whatever they throw my way. I'm like, yeah, I think I can. I give that a shot. I think I had to. So they they randomly just sent me Joseph Gordon Levitt last night just as, and I'd never like man I don't think I've ever had to try to even sound like him before, so it's just I don't even know who I'm gonna get and sometimes I don't even recognize the names and I just have to listen to the vocal qualities. Sometimes looking them up helps and sometimes it doesn't. So it's like when I don't know who they are, I'm like maybe I should figure out who they are and then I'm like oh yeah I know who that guy. Uh, but yeah, I filled in for. Uh, well, yeah, you know, it might be better if there if you don't have that sound in your head because the sound in your head is, is very rarely what they actually sound like, you know. So if it, you do have to problem. look it up and then start, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, digging into the nuances that I can imagine that makes it easier, actually. Well, they, they, they have this one little problem of sending us references to the actor as the, themselves from like a talk show. And I'm like, do you have anything of them doing the character that they're performing in the movie or show? Because they're not going to sound like in an interview what they sound like in a movie or show. And I'm like, that's and I've lost several auditions because they did not have a good reference. And then when I heard the final version of what they were supposed to sound like, I'm like, well, that was nothing like what they sound like in a talk show. It's no wonder that I didn't get the job. So, you know, tell yeah, people I'm, what this I'm, stuff is if they have no idea what we're talking about. What is this ADO? We've well, talked about a, it before on the channel, but what's the what's the deal? Uh, there's a couple of different ways to do ADR. Um, it's it's very similar to dubbing. I've done some anime before, and it's just it's some ADR is literally just like when you record for an animated uh, series or cartoon, whatever, where you actually see what's going on on the screen, and they actually have the beeps up, deet, 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 and then you have to say what fits in the flaps of the mouth, or if it's an off-camera voice like re the, tr Danny Trejo. That's the other one I've been filling in for. So I was doing Danny Trejo. I was like doing it like, you know, it was like not on camera. So it was like off in the background, like, come on, get to the chopper. And it's just like you you can't tell that that's not him in the context of the film. Once they add in the sound effects, once they add in the ambient background, there's multiple layers of sound. So it could be done that way. <laughs> just, it could be done just to hide if you suck. <laughs> well, that too, because sometimes these low budget films, they can't afford to get the actor to do it themselves or, you know, they can't afford a, a full rate. So they'll just find somebody non you that does a decent sound alike or sometimes they'll just do it themselves. Uh, I believe well, I mean, direct. that's normally why they do ADR is because everything's wrapped and then they bring the, the, the principles back in and they fix this and that. But then they find other stuff that needs to be fixed. Yep. But then these guys are making 18 zillion dollars and you're only okay. making, you know, a quarter zillion. So yeah. um, I, uh, I went into Legendary probably 14 to 17 times for Detective Pikachu and once at Warner Brothers. And Ryan Reynolds went in once. <laughs> so there's the reason, because if they had to pay him 17 times, it would probably rack up. Plus, he's freaking crazy busy. Some of these actors just can't break away. And if they do have to record it, they don't want to do it from the car where it sounds terrible. And if they do, it sounds terrible. And the other option is for them to Frankenstein up the lines 
to make it make sense in the context of the trailer. So a lot of what I get usually is very quick turnaround time where it's like, hey, we got this trailer. We need to sound like for this guy. Or we need to scratch the voice for this guy before we actually hire the actual actor to come in and record their own voice for it. So it's a lot cheaper to get me to do it and I'm more available and I can do it 10, 15 times till they have what they want and then they can go to Ryan Reynolds or whoever it is and have him do it himself. But luckily for me, I wore my brown pants, so it's fine. Everything's good. Yeah, it's good to be the guy. <laughs> So you bust your ass, and then he goes in on one take, and he's done. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah but you know, it's very, it's very lucrative, and it, the sessions don't take long, uh, and it's keeping the kids fed and clothed and housed. So I'm cool with it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a lot big. It's, a, it's a business. I didn't or an area of the industry that I didn't even know existed until just a couple of years ago, and then it just kind of exploded into the biggest part of my my income, which is crazy. It's. <laughs> Dude, oh, you and have then, and then, fallen and then ass backwards. <laughs> Literally, I did. I just kind of fell into this awesome career. Um, but there's also ADR Looping, which actually has a group of people that come in and actually fill in all the vocal background stuff for an actual film or TV show. And sometimes in the context of that, they'll have somebody who does sound alikes for specific actors. And they'll walla, have to walla, do that walla, while they're there. But yeah, it's all walla walla background, whatever. And I've done stuff like that for Krampus and... Uh, Detective Pikachu and different films. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff you don't even realize, and it kind of it kind of ruins some of the movie magic for me because I'll watch a film and all of a sudden I find myself focusing too hard on the background and realizing, oh, that sounds terrible. That guy broke the rule. There's a rule you can't you can't talk about this or that because <laughs> you can't talk about any products. You can't use any actors or real names of anybody. You can't say anything negative. They put one of the uh, I took a class at Johnny Gidcomb. Johnny Gidcomb is actually probably one of the busiest ADR um, uh, directors that I know because you'll see his name in like Logan and you'll see it in Avengers and you know all, all these different Marvel big big action they're usually the big big action movies and uh, so he was <laughs> he gave us a scene where we had to all, and the rule was you have to be positive and he's like okay you're in the ER <laughs> and there's 14 people in there trying to stay positive in the emergency room and uh, <laughs> so and of course, one of my groups like, I hope mom recovers from her cancer. I'm like, <laughs> would, she, would she be in the ER for cancer? And I'm like, how do I spin this positively? And I'm like, well, at least she's not in any pain. She's doing really well right now. The treatment seems to be working. And everybody kept going negative. Like, what's wrong with you people? So yeah, there's there's lots of different versions of ADR, but all of it's basically just re-recording di dialogue or recording for dialogue, smoothing something out, replacing something. And in trailers, it gives context where there wasn't any in the original audio or Maybe they just needed. Sometimes I'll just do the narrator voice. I'll be. I'll do the actor like Jeff Bridges, for example. Like there's a, there's a story you know going on, man, and he's like the narrator for the show, and he's like telling you what's going on in the context. And maybe they didn't say it in the film, but they need it for the trailer because they only have like a minute or two to explain what the movie's about, man. You know, so sometimes it's just narration or storytelling, or sometimes it's actually you know matching up with the flaps of the lips. But I've. I've had some freaking crazy stories, dude. <laughs> some really fun jobs that I'm like, man, this business is just, I freaking love my job. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't suck, man. It doesn't. It do You know what? I mean, it's great. See, here's the thing. Because you got this like rags to riches. Not for nothing, but you've been busting your ass for a decade. So it's not yeah, like it's you just, you know what I mean? Like out of nowhere. <laughs> but that, you know, but you always, oh, I got in good and then whatever. And then there's people who are going to watch this and they have no... The thing is also, you know, this guy's incredibly talented, for God's sakes. You guys can't, you know, not everybody can do these voices and pull this stuff off. Um, I just, I don't want I you, great, so I don't want you un, to be a bad influence, you know? Right? Yes. Yeah, we can say whatever. So I have a great story for you because it's just directly applying to this particular part of the industry. And it's one of my favorites. So I got hired, uh, if anybody remembers this game, called or the movie called Ender's Game. It was another young adult sci-fi, very much when Divergent, Mocking, and uh, uh, Hunger Games were like, that was the biggest thing, was all young adult film series. And Harrison Ford plays this this character in it. So I got cast to, or booked, uh, doing Harrison Ford sound like, and then I got canceled before I actually did the session. And I was like, everything cool? And they're like, no, 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 Harrison Ford just wants to come in and do it himself. And they're like, well, they're not going to tell him no. So my the version of the story I was told from the director was because uh, they cast me again. And I was like, uh, what's going on? I thought Harrison Ford was doing his own. It's like, yeah, well, he uh, he came in super baked, like so freaking high <laughs> and completely <laughs> wait. Like you could smell alcohol and weed on him. 
And he came in like he does in the Oscars, and he just talked like he was reading out of a phone book. And it was, and they said you did a better job of acting like Harrison Ford than Harrison Ford did like acting like Harrison Ford. Harrison like, Ford's like a million years old. That's too, a man. crazy compliment. If so you really yeah, you it. did a better Harrison than Harrison. <laughs> Dang. I know, that's, that's, it's a, uh, that's an endorsement. Give me, give me my fifty grand, and I'll be on my way. God. <laughs> Yeah, you got man. What are you gonna do though? When he's just freaking Han Solo, man, he could show up naked. Like, what are you gonna? What are you gonna complain? Exactly. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> yeah, he's the freaking cool. Okay, so, all right. So this is not really a surprise. If you listen to the voice, kind of your tendencies, uh, your vocal tendencies. Somehow along the line, you wound up as Optimus freaking Prime. Yeah, true story. <laughs> what for? What for? A couple mini series, and then is this ongoing? And what? How are you? The um, next freaking Peter Cullen? I'm trying to think back to when this all started. Uh, I, th- I mean, the, the seeds for this thing have been planted a long time. I've been a Transformers fan clearly for you know 35 years. Well, you've done other my... Transformers stuff as yeah. well. But yeah. I mean, Optimus so is. For, I got you know... interested into it because I first heard Peter Cullen, who's the original voice of Optimus Prime. I heard him uh, doing the intro for the original Voltron cartoon in the 80s. It wasn't actually from Transformers. And that for some reason, that voice just freaking stuck with me. That Voltron, defender of the universe. And I was like, that's freaking cool. I want to be that when I grow up. I didn't even know what that meant, but that's what I, I wanted to be that voice when I grew up. And then I heard him again as Optimus Prime in Transformers, and that instantly got me hooked. And I started playing with the toys and just like became a super fan. And uh, I'd been working on that voice since I was a little kid with a Fisher Price tape recorder recording all the trans. I started doing impressions and started getting good at, at improvisation and stuff through Transformers partially. And uh, I introduced myself to the folks at Comic Con a few times over at Hasbro. And I got introduced to Hasbro from Star Wars, actually, back when I first got started in voiceover. It was my first year, second month doing this professionally. I booked the Star Wars commercial campaign for uh, the Clone Wars, the Captain Rex. And it was. Um, like four or five commercials where I was filling in for, for D. Bradley Baker's voice. And I learned then that Hasbro hires non, non-union actors to do commercials and any promo stuff that's not officially the video games or the movies or the shows. And I'm like, oh, okay. And even even if they use clips that you know, are actually from the cartoon, they still redub them. I'm like, interesting. Lindsay and was when, just talking today, just this afternoon, she was complaining about... Uh, toy commercials and how they're always like they want like buyouts and perp and they want to pay like freaking 700 bucks and stuff it's a weird it's weird how they how they do yeah and because of that it got me the job of also doing voices for toys so i'd instantly marked off two off my nerd list star wars check toy voices check so i was i'm actually the voice of captain rex and three different toys i believe and then uh, anakin skywalker and one very specific toy that only released internationally and again another weird funny story but that's actually how because of the anakin toy is how i got introduced to the toy department at hasbro because the girl who worked on that uh used to work on transformers animated and i was like oh transformers i was like because she i remember coming in on the the skype call or not the skype call the isdn connection came on and they were talking about transformers she's like i just could not find a good bumblebee sound alike and I did a great movie. And you're like, like ooh, man, ooh, I wish ooh, 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 if, wait. <laughs> if only you had known me a month or two ago. And then uh, she's like, oh, do you do it? And I'd been told by the studio, don't do any voices for them unless they specifically ask you to. If they ask you to, you can do them. And I'm like, OK, I understand rules. And she's like and she I mentioned that I do Optimus Prime and I'd been doing it for like 30 years or however many years at the time. And she's like, oh, can I hear it? And I'm like, well, she asked. And I did the entire monologue from the 2007 movie from memory in Optimus Prime's voice. And she was like, that was the best I ever heard. And I, I recorded Peter Cullen. I even geeked out in front of him. I didn't even mean to. She was like, Mr. Cullen, can we get a level? And he's like, my name is Optimus Prime. And she's like, yes, you are Optimus Prime. And I, so we kind of hit off a little bit of a friendship with that. And she passed on my information to Hasbro's Transformers department. And the guys at Comic-Con are like, oh, yeah, you worked on us with Star Wars. We also worked on some Transformers stuff. Dude, Would there was just in- like 18 nerd keywords in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was like, would you be interested in doing any Transformers voices? And I'm like, absolutely. But I also know the guy who does that for them, and he still is doing it for them. But that, again, kind of helped build 
the bridge over to the people where I needed to get in front of to be able to do voices for Transformers stuff. And it just happened to be Machinima, who was who produced the the Transformers series that I worked on, were at the Hasbro booth interviewing folks. And they knew me from Honest Trailers and kind of connected the dots. And once Honest Trailers became a thing where people recognized it, then all of a sudden I went from being ignored at booths to being like, oh, you're the guy that works on that thing. Yeah, we definitely need to connect. That meeting led to being – I didn't even have to audition. They just they just cast me as Optimus Prime because the Combiner Wars, the first season, was a ridiculously low budget. So there's no way they could get Peter Cullen in. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. As long as Peter Cullen, because I've, I've always lived by the rule of don't take another voice actor's job. And it's like, as long as Peter Cullen has just straight up said no and refuses to do it or legally can't do it or, you know, passes whatever reason, if, if he's not doing it, I'm fine with it. But if he wants to do it, I would prefer him to do it because he's my favorite and he should be the voice because he created the character. So the first season was me. Then they built up their budget and then they recast me with with Peter Cullen, which I thought was freaking great. So that was my first time actually voicing Optimus Prime. And because of that, the director got a call from Hasbro after they heard what I'd done and said, congratulations, Hasbro really wants to use you for a lot more stuff. And they started contacting me with several different kinds like commercials and promos and all this and internal read stuff, stuff that Peter Cullen just would not do. And it ended up being a lot more than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, this is really cool. I mean, I'm not. I'm not the official voice of Optimus Prime. I was for that one animated series, but this is freaking great. It's ongoing work, and I'm getting to do the voice of my favorite character, my favorite voice, and getting to do all this other stuff. And then I connected from that, uh, that getting doing the a lot the ADR sound alike stuff for for Peter Cullen led to booking um, the ADR scratch stuff for the Bumblebee movie. And I had auditioned for Bumblebee a couple of times, same script, same characters. Didn't hear anything back. Just said, you know, I gave it my best shot. Whatever. And while I was there recording for Optimus Prime, they said, well, we have some other characters to scratch. And I knew it had to have been those things that I auditioned for. So I knew what it was. And uh, I was up there with Steve Bloom. And if you if you know anything about voice actors at all, you know that Steve has worked on Transformers a lot. And she's like, we just need to know the characters you've booked before. And I'm like, great. Because <laughs> I've booked one. And he's like, done it, done it, done it, didn't do it, done it, done it, done it. And by the time he got done, there was like two guys left. And neither one of them are favorites of mine. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I, while I was in there, I did my three, and then I said, if you don't mind, would, would, would you mind if I tried out with some of the other characters? Because I've been doing these voices for 35 years, and if you want, you know, accurate, original voices, I can do that for you. He's like, yeah, absolutely, give it a shot. And I, we had a conversation back and forth about Shockwave's voice being based on David Warner's Sark from Tron, and that was the impression that uh, Corey Burton was doing when he came up with the voice, and the, talking about the vocoder effects for sound. Like, he could tell I was a freaking fan. And like, he's like, man, that's stuff I didn't even know before. And then after all that was said and done, I had no idea what was going to happen. I was happy to, to record the temporary voices and fingers crossed that something good would happen from it. And after I left that last session, I found out afterwards I had been working directly with Travis Knight himself. And I had no idea that it was him this entire time. And I don't know what I did, if it was just the fact that I was confident enough to say, hey, can I try recording some of these other voices? Maybe it's because I've showed some guts or maybe he just thought I was really impressive or whatever well, it's, reason. It's fairly ballsy. Yeah, I thought so. I was like, you know what? Why not? The same, same, uh, you know, advice my wife would give me. What's the worst that can happen? They'll just say no. Well, right? and I mean, how many more, uh, you know, like you're saying, you've been doing these voices for so long and like, this is the friggin' opportunity to pull yeah, them right? out of your I mean, ass, for God's sakes, times, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, I knew this could be a once in op a lifetime opportunity. And I was like, why not just ask? and give it a shot. So I ended up booking Shockwave and Soundwave for the Bumblebee film with a guaranteed on-screen credit. My name's right up there, and my voice is right there with Peter Cullen, which is one of the biggest items on my bucket list that I never thought I would check off, working with Optimus Prime in Transformers with him as Optimus and me as, as another character. And I was like, holy crap, that is his voice, my voice, and my voice, like, all together. And us, us on freaking screen on the credits together. So that was just freaking blown away. And uh, yeah, it just it kind of came full circle. I ended up going from just a fan and taking the thing that, or the, at least the man and the franchise that kind of inspired me in that direction and ended up working in that. So now I'm just, you know, beating my head against the wall and trying to see if there's anything else I can book, video games or movies or cartoon shows or whatever I can do. I'm, uh, I'm working on it. So, but yeah, now I'm officially voices in Transformers and things. It's freaking cool, man. That is cool. So... There's my segue right there. What I thought was cool was this freak of this car commercial. <laughs> because 
you never see voiceover people like you know in general uh the don had done that spy, whatever the uh, geico thing or whatever like a million years ago and then when i saw this i said man that's freaking cool wait a second i got a thing morning welcome to mitsubishi interested in the test drive yeah, yeah. sure i'll grab the keys man let's go Handles pretty nice, right? Handles really well. Can you check out the stereo? Wow, dramatic. Introducing the 2019 Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. If you like sculpted lines, you'll love its dynamic design. In a world of asphalt, gravel, and snow, super all-wheel control will save the day. Or maybe Stephanie will find romance where she least expects it with a dual-pane panoramic sunroof. What? And a fully loaded, technologically advanced cockpit that will transport you to another universe. <laughs> Audiences agree. With a 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain limited warranty, the Eclipse Cross is a must-see. Now showing at a dealership near you. <laughs> that was crazy. Oh, are you? My cheeks are like... Her cheeks are on fire. <laughs> it's just like this car. It's pretty epic. This car is as epic as my voice. Test drive a new crossover at your local Mitsubishi dealer. Drive your ambition. What's, ha what's happening here? <laughs> Well, uh, Mitsubishi had seen the pranks that were done by one of the channels that was also owned by the same company that owns Screen Junkies, which makes Honest Trailers, and they had me doing this. Really, it was just me improvising things behind people, you know, walking up and down the street, what they were wearing, what they were doing, you know, if they looked like a celebrity, just making up fun stuff or whatever. Um, there, they tried to feed me lines into the headphones, headset things, and sometimes that worked, and sometimes it didn't. And I'm not a big fan of like hurting people's feelings or making people feel bad. So I tried. Well, to you're probably not a fan of getting punched you know, in the face either when you're on you know, the street, man. That I never, I was never really worried about. You know, I try to take pick by targets carefully and look at like these these people look like they can take a joke and they're that they're nice and fun. And it's like I'm not really doing anything. It's freaking L.A. You know, everybody sees people talking to themselves on the streets out there <laughs> but no it was fine everything was and i get that question asked a lot it's like did anybody punch you anybody get mad I'm like not one freaking person i was just kind of making people happier not making people angry but the mitsubishi liked that concept but because of contract situations i couldn't do it exactly the same way but this was a very specific scripted thing not necessarily a prank prank it was more of a rug pull type deal like i'm just supposed to be a car salesman that happens to also be a movie trailer voice, but the people that were in the test drives did not know that. Um, and it was interesting to see their reactions. But the, the the funny part about this is that before the shoots, they told them that I was an actual car salesman. So I was like, well, yeah, that's I what I was wondering. Like, technically, I mean, are you, these people are, I guess they get the, uh, they get all their paperwork and releases afterwards so that they don't wreck the, you know, the, the, exactly. the surprise. So they, they no but idea, so they but go I'm, in with I'm, the, and then I guess they talk to yeah. a real salesperson and then they say, oh, this guy is the guy that's going to come exactly. with you for and the they told me thing. That I, they told them that I was the real salesman and I didn't know a friggin' thing about the car except for what was in the script. <laughs> so they're asking me things about, you know, what kind of gas mileage does it get? Or I'm like, oh, I was just kind of smoothing over every single way, like oh yeah it gets oh dude such good gas mileage like so good <laughs> like that was kind of my go-to like oh so good so good where, like, and, so where good. what do they got gopros in the the air conditioners yeah, had, or what they had uh they had go so they they knew they were in a car commercial they just didn't know what was going to happen so they had gopros mounted up in each corner and i, I need a freaking girl man i look like freaking you know. <laughs> uh but they had my seat like leaned way back so my stomach's closer to the camera, and I'm way back here. It was apparently the only way. They, they had a body double coming in the day before to sit exactly where the seat needed to go in order to keep all the wires from getting messed up or whatever and keep the cameras, everything in focus. And they used those those weird, you know, like, uh, um, what are those things called? Goldfish bowl, fish fish, but fish eye lenses, which right, is good. Right. On the side. So it's very awkward looking <laughs> like yeah. stuff. The, and, uh, the camera adds 30 pounds. I know. I'm very thin camera, myself. Yeah, this I mean, is I'd just lost, it's YouTube. It makes me of, look. I'd lost, I'd lost like 30, 40 pounds before this happened. And then like saw the commercial. I'm like, geez, I look freaking twice as big as I normally look. And uh, But yeah, other than that, it was it was fun. It was just a long day of shoot. We started at like 5, 530 in the morning. I had to go there overnight, sleep in a hotel. Did not sleep because I was nervous. I don't do on-camera stuff. I just, I'm just i much more comfortable. Well, like that's that. what was, like I said, was so cool. I mean, so many things about what you do go back to the Don. But for me, yeah. that was a big deal. Yeah, that Geico um, commercial. You know, just because you were seen. It's nice for, for somebody yep. in voiceover to get some sort of, 
You know what I mean? It's like, it, oh yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. me. It, it just makes me happy, almost like, like the, proud, the, almost the, to see a the, nod, to see. Like, oh look, like, there's a face for Christ's sake. This is a human being. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the Forza commercial with uh, with Maurice LaMarche, which is just like the the announcer supposed to be doing a nature documentary, and it's actually you know this hardcore racing game, and it's like stuff like that. I freaking I love it when they show the actors on camera doing the actual narration. Um, I did. Well, yeah, because it's uh, you know voiceover is so buried, man. You know, it was cool. Yeah. So okay, so this is an all day thing. Did you shoot this like ten times with other people, and oh, their reactions so just stunk, times. or yeah, th these dude, were their favorites? So so many. These were just the ones that were the best reactions, I think. But yeah, we did from 5.30 till, I think we were there from 5.30 till 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. So yeah, it was almost a full 12 hours plus a lunch break. But yeah, that was uh, that was interesting to say the least. I can say that I, I do love voiceover more than on-camera work because on-camera work takes up so much more time and makeup and getting things to... Yeah, you know, right. there's always a comparison and then inevitably somebody will be like, well, you know, in like real acting and then the, pitch, oh, the pitchforks and the torches come out and whatever, yeah. you know. But, you know, listen, man, for, you for don't have to memorize your lines in voiceover. It's right there. There's no, like, hitting the mark. That's the tough part, man, for voiceover. But, you know, to be, oh, and I got to be there and there and whatever. And Because you don't think about that. And are, yep. uh, Now, there's so many things that are harder uh, in voice. You know, you don't have your face and your eyes and your hands and all that stuff. You know, it all has to come yep. from your voice. So it's, uh, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. But... It is a completely different animal. Oh, and the industry is so compartmental. I mean, there's just so many different areas, like Steve Bloom and Frank Welker and and D. Bradley Baker, like the amazing creature voice guys. Uh, Fred Tatashore, you know what I mean? Uh, then you have guys that are extremely good with just straight narration for audiobooks, and they're just they can maintain their voices for hours and hours and hours. And then you have people that are like professionally scream and. To audience, I mean, it's, it's such a vast freaking thing. There's just like so many different places, and the people talk about so much about competition and like that's not real acting or this or that. But I'm like, dude, there's plenty of work for everybody, and yeah, it requires skills and a skill set. Like, there's not one actor that just does everything. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's work. You know, that's a that's a big surprise for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. this is like yeah, really it's like not easy. yeah, like Chris no, Rock it's said freaking it was. work, man. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> No. Well, yeah, you know what, though? For him, it probably would because it's, you know, this Hollywood guy. Yes, are, because he's We've talked about this before, too. Rock. I got no, like, uh, you know, sour grapes against uh, on camera guys. But, yeah, man, either, they get their asses like, it's, kissed, it's, man. You know, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, I mean, it's such a misconception when you have these huge studios and they hire big celebrities because they, they're thinking talk show circuit and press junkets and stuff. And they need somebody that's not just a good voice actor, they need somebody that, that, parents and adults recognize like has to be a freaking celebrity and they're getting hired to be themselves sandler's getting hired to be sandler you know chris rock's being hired to chris rock so of course he gets paid a million dollars when he just opens his mouth because that's what he's getting paid to do and when you're a celebrity at that level that's the kind of money that you get to do voiceover but yeah. for the rest of it it's freaking hard work and it takes a long time to build up that skill set and learn. i mean you have to just do the same thing and sometimes make the same mistakes over and over and over again until you finally figure it out and they're like that's what i'm doing i need to do it this way so how do you feel then about celebrity voiceover in like uh animated features because a lot of people or even in general because a lot of voice talent get really pissed off and it's always the same thinking they go i could have done better and in a lot of cases they could have um but again, you know, they don't have the personality. Like you're saying, people are being hired, you know, for their personalities. Yeah. Uh, but for a lot of these animated things, um, especially, but even some na narration and stuff too, you go, man, that was not, that person, uh, you know, did maybe oh, a passable yeah. job, but they were hired because, uh, you know, you can't put freaking, you know, Joe Schmo voice yeah. actor on the billboard. You need, you know, yep. a, a recognizable name. Yeah. But does see... that kind of piss you off or you're just like, whatever? Well, I mean, I'm I'll, I'm fine with celebrities getting hired for for voiceover as long as they're actually doing a good job at it. When they're doing a terrible job, it does take me off because I'm like, they got paid hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do a terrible job. But when they're good, like Tom Hanks, he's freaking good. And that's the reason why they hired Tom Hanks. But you're also like voice actors often don't look at 
are you already a celebrity? Are you already making millions of dollars? Are you a recognizable face? That Because the business side of things, that's exactly why the studios hire them. It's not just because they have great voices. They hire them for multiple reasons. Are they good performers? Are they recognizable? Are well, they I mean, popular? they are actors. Are they hot for right now? Say. Are they trending? Are they, do they have a huge fan base on social media? Can we work in part of our promotion budget with these actors in order to do it? So, yes, performance-wise, I would love for it to all go to voice actors who specifically do voice acting. But actors are actors. You keep, you keep banging that drum saying, well... Voice acting is acting, too. If that's the case, then on-camera acting is acting, too. So don't be mad if they auditioned for it and got it or they knew exactly what they wanted and they got a specific actor because he's really good and he's famous and he's a good guy to work with and he's a great actor, whatever. There's a lot of different – there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. Uh, but I don't think it's just fair to say, well, it should just go to regular voice actors and all these celebrities should never do any voice work. They're, they're working, too, man. I know on-camera actors that struggle just as much as I do. And they're just looking for work like everybody else. And, I mean, obviously there's a difference between the layers of, you know, celebrities and the top brass. They're, they're, they've already done their – they paid their dues. I mean, look at Jennifer Aniston. She went from freaking leprechauns to being a super mega movie star. She's put her work in, man. She's earned it. And I thought she did an amazing job in Iron Giant. I didn't even realize it was her until I saw the credits. That's how good she was. So – you know, people can complain, but the business is the business. And every time I've gone to see an animated movie, there's a huge freaking chunk of additional actors, including myself sometimes, that have worked on this film. So there is still work there to be done. Uh, I saw in uh, at the end of Toy Story, Scott Menville, Tara Strong, freaking Carlos Allen's Rocky, uh, Betty White and Carol Burnett were in the additional voice credits. They're movie stars to me. They're superstars to me, and they're in downing of the additional voices with everybody else. So, and sometimes even the main cast, Lori Allen, is the mom on Toy Story Four. That was freaking great. So it does happen for it's not just it's not just movie stars. There's work for there's work there. And if you want to get those big big gigs, you're gonna have to go become a celebrity and become a movie star to get the celebrity because it's a specific job. It's a celebrity movie star voiceover. It's not just a voiceover for anybody. They, they don't just audition us for the main role in a Pixar film because who are we? You know, I mean, yeah, we might be a great performer, but they have to factor all that other stuff in. You know, they're starting to. And, I you know, I had seen this on social media like not too long ago, a couple months ago. And I said, no, that's not a thing. And then I was like, look at this. It is a thing uh, where auditions are coming out and they're asking, do you have a big social media presence? Mm-hmm. For the just for the voiceover. Time. Oh, it's 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 like it's what? Now the... I got to have a lot of Insta people. But you're freaking huge. Online, I mean, it's it, it, talk about like a, you know a full circle thing again. You started with this stupid, you know, your wife setting you up on on uh, MySpace for God. You're you. First of all, nobody subs to this f- channel for. If you're watching, <laughs> subscribe for Christ's sake. Hey, you got like a hundred million thousand uh, subscribers on your stuff. I now. Only on have like I have less, quite a little less than one hundred fifty thousand, or right at one hundred fifty thousand. But that doesn't reflect the views. So it's it's. It it looks good on the surface, but you know when you only average fifteen hundred to two thousand views, is it really all that much? You know, uh, I think but a lot a, a lot of how people actor, found you and so many of your stories, you know, are these. It well, this one met it, this yeah. one and met that one and met the other one and whatever, and then they found me yeah. from this thing and whatever. But uh, uh, you know, admittedly, a lot of that was from uh, oh, the honest trailers thing, and everybody saw those online. Yeah, and people found me on Honest Trailers through my own YouTube channel, which, you know, I, I'm a big fan uh, and been an advocate for putting as many things out there as you possibly can to show out what you're good at. And I happen to be good at doing voices, so I made that the central theme of everything that I create. And every time I see something that could be a potential outlet to get more uh, recognition to build my brand up, I'm like, yeah, I'll freaking throw something out there like TikTok. Uh, I recently did a animated uh an animated little you know fake video thing of uh, pikachu auditions and it did a bunch of celebrity impressions like auditioning for pikachu and threw it up on uh freaking threw it up on uh tiktok which is a new a new social media thing it's like very very vine like vine slash musically and it got freaking two hundred and twenty thousand views in like a week and a half and that doesn't usually happen for me but if there's potential to get that many views and build up a brand of being good at something specific like voiceover, friggin' do it. I mean, would you rather, if you're really looking to go fishing and you need to catch fish for food, which is what I'm doing, I'm working. I'm not just doing this for fun, although it is a fun job. Uh, and I probably would still be doing it for fun as a hobby, but it's my career. So I need to be able to eat. So going out to fish for the purpose of getting the fish to eat 
have as many fishing poles in the water as possible. Vine, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever's, whatever the kids are watching, get your butt out there and try to get something done. If you don't know what you're doing, A, don't be afraid of it. B, find somebody who does know what they're doing or just do the research yourself and collaborate with people, work with people, find out what works and what doesn't. You know, it does not all, it, it's not all instant. And a lot of these kids, especially millennials, they'll, they're so impatient. And I'm like, well, I, I did one or two videos and nothing happened for me. Like, well, you know, it took me 10 years to book a movie and I'm not even a main character. So. Well, and it's focus. <laughs> you know, you are, it's a, a cocaine. I know it's a lot of cocaine, but you're very, <laughs> <laughs> you work, man. You put stuff out. You have energy and you put it out there. You know, like you say, it's, it's something's bound to You can't, you to can't hit, take a you break, know? man. You got to keep freaking going. I, I've known people who thought it was it was as simple as just getting someone who could get the auditions for you and you just sit back and just wait for the fame and the fortune and the money to come. And I'm like, none of that really matters. Okay. Fame and fortune don't pay the bills, but money does. And in this business, you got to freaking keep working because if you stop working, money's not going to just come in. Eventually it's going to stop coming in. So you have to constantly stay working. We don't, I don't, not everybody out there has a stack of residual checks per month. That's this, this big to live off of. So you just have to constantly keep booking. And how do you book? You get better at your job. You audition more. You go take classes. You do more research. You network more. You make more content. You build up your social media brand. It's a lot of different, a lot of moving parts. As I keep saying, it's a lot of moving parts. You're focused. I like, listen, <laughs> speaking of, because we got to let you go in a few minutes, where are you off to? I uh, headed off to E3. Uh, I'm going to go hang out with the casting director of, 4K, of 2K Games. Um, which I'm working on some new stuff for them. I can't talk about yet, unfortunately. But you can hear me as the council guy in all of the XCOM games, as well as uh, Jack Tice, the uh, commentator from WWE 2K19, and a few other things coming down the pipe. So, yeah. What's, what's the new thing? I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. Ah, uh, I thought I'd get all you. Right. Good. Yeah. That was going to be our gotcha. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. Non-disclosure agreements. Freaking ironclad. Clack, clack. Listen, yeah, no kidding, man. Listen. Tell me about, you want to hear a freaking story for Christ's sake? No, you got to go. Anyway, I had a bunch of, act, everybody had to send back NDAs today. I cannot tell you how many freaking actors do not have the capacity to email back a signed document. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, just a bu they just take their cell phone and take pictures and it's like on the floors, like their socked feet next yeah, to the, th I've, like, I've this is a legal to, document, you freak. I've had to do that one or once or twice when it didn't, it didn't want to work out. Now they've got phones where they're better at actually digitally signing these things. I'm like, you know, oh, we I've, have the tech now. I'm telling you, man, I can't even technology. tell you how many people do not know how to sign, freaking send an NDA. But I wanted to put in one thing real quick because it's a cool thing that you do. Uh, yeah. What's with these phone messages that you do? Phone messages. Oh, you mean the fiber thing? Yeah. Uh, so I started a fiber page because my wife got ticked off at me doing free requests for fans all the time. And uh, so uh, I found out about Fiverr. It's two R's, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R, and I found out it's like you can post any job that you want to do and you start at five bucks. And so I, it took me a little while to kind of figure out how it worked. But then once it down came down to it, it was like, oh, yeah, okay. So I, I'll, I'll be fine with doing like 25 words for five bucks and it'll go towards charity. And A, it scared away all the people that are just like, oh, I got free stuff. You know, I got somebody to say, so, some voice actor who had better things to do with his time to say this ridiculous thing for my whatever it is. So now it's like, oh, you have to pay money. So that kind of filtered out a lot of people from requesting free things all the time. So that saves me time where I can actually spend in my actual business. And then the second thing it did is raised money to go toward Autism Society of America. So no longer am I doing it for free. Uh, and I'm actually giving back to the community, doing something good with the money. So it was like, oh, this works out for everybody. I'm not doing anything for free. This keeps all the people away for that are just trying to get a bunch of free stuff for me. And the money I do make can go to a good cause. Everybody wins for once, you know? Listen, first of all, massive disclaimer. Any voice talent that are watching, don't do freaking voiceovers yeah. on Fiverr, do for Christ's sake. Don't, don't do yeah, please. Fiber. But this is what you're doing is very different. You're doing a cool thing. Exactly. Uh, you're helping people. Out. And instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to do all this stuff for free. Uh, we'll do it for a few bucks, which still allows you to, you know, it's not like you're asking for millions of dollars. So you're yeah, still able like to do something cool for and, your fans and yeah. at the same time raise a few bucks for a worthy cause. So yeah. that's cool, Usually man. it's like, oh, check out our podcast or it's like, hey, congratulations on your anniversary or it's, you know, happy birthday or my name is Optimus Prime and, you know, happy birthday to Gavin who's only four years old. To, you know, so it's just a little bitty stuff, you know, and it's added up. You know, I've been on it for three years maybe and I've, 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 
probably done like 20 grand in three years of money towards Autism Society of America. Say it with me. Again, everybody, don't do voiceover on Fiverr. (laughs) This is different. This is very different what we're talking about. This is not the same way. I think this this actually is the, the only way I would recommend a voiceover artist of any kind of professional nature doing Fiverr is if you're doing it for a good cause or something. Don't do it. To get jobs no. no, but what I'm saying, it's a cool thing that you're doing. You found, you found a way to give back. Um, yeah. So I always got to give people props for that, man, when you do the right thing because uh, it's too rare nowadays. So you got to go. Plug, plug, yeah. plug, plug. What do you got? Uh, just add Epic Voice Guy and all the social stuff. Um, my favorite new app that I'm on is called Stardust. And you can download it for free, create a profile, a free profile. It works just like Instagram stories, except it's specifically for movie and TV show reviews and trailer reactions. And I do some really fun, you know, unique stuff just to me. I do a lot of celebrities reviewing their own films or reacting to their own trailers. Um, and I also got approved for Disney press passes and other screenings from real D 3d and from IMAX. So I get to see the movies early so you can find out about them before everybody else does. And if you tag me in your own reactions, I'll be sure to check them out and leave a comment. So yeah, it's all free at Epic voice guy. And, uh, as far as I know, other than you folks outside of the, in the UK area, they're still working out some legal issues with the whole internet thing. I don't know what the deal is overseas, but in the U S you know, feel free to follow me everywhere else. I'm at, 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 Epic, at Epic Voice Guy and on TikTok, which is also brand new. I'm at the Epic Voice Guy or yeah, the Epic Voice Guy with a the, with a the to T-H-E. And I think that's it. <laughs> John, thank oh, you. Oh, and, you, and go watch Detective Pikachu. It's a really fun movie and look for my name in the credits because that's, that's a great movie. It's really funny. Yeah, we'll have to pause it. Well, not in the theater, but when it comes out <laughs> in the thing. Thank you very much. Go have fun and yeah, my uh, pleasure. mingle in network, and we'll talk soon. Never Thank stop you. working, man. <laughs> no, exactly. Thank you. The great John Bailey. How friggin' cool, right, man? Yeah, cool. But again, you know, listen, voice people, I don't want you to be, hey, look, he did it, and then it was quick. He got a thing and whatever. The guy's massively talented, um, and he works his ass off. And, uh, you know, you need to, uh, you need both in this business. Uh, and he's a perfect example of that. So I want to thank him very much for being on the show. That's that. Uh, join us next week. We have the amazing Bob Bergen, Porky Pig. We're going to talk about the union, man. I want to get in it deep. Uh, and we got some other fun surprises waiting uh, in store in the wings. So sub, like, whatever. Bye. <laughs>